It's an absolute privilege and pleasure to uh, have with us today Professor Jack Nongara from the University of Tennessee and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, Jack's been a, a presence in computational science for my entire career. When I say a presence, he's one of the actual rock stars of computational science, right? I mean, and I use that word very sparingly, right? But people with such, such pervasive presence and leadership that they really figureheads in what we do. So anyone who actually computes, right, if you're running MATLAB or R, if you're uh, running code in parallel, you're probably using software that Jack's actually designed or led the teams that design that software. So MPI, LAPAC, the BLAS, uh, these are just a snippet of uh, some of the things that Jack's had influence on. And uh, as soon as the idea was floated to have Jack here, it was immediately approved as uh, part of the Provost uh, Lecture Series, which is, of course, our most distinguished series on campus. And so having said all that, you'd have thought I'd have come up with the idea of inviting Jack. But actually, it wasn't me. It was the IACS Student Association who, as their inaugural uh, seminar speaker, came up with Jack's name. And I think they couldn't have come up with a better one. And so my job today actually isn't to introduce Jack, it's to introduce uh, Emilio Sofianopoulos, who's the president of the IACS Student Association. Emilio. So thank you, Dr. Harrison, for the introduction. So uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, the Provost Lecture Series and the Provost Office for helping us bring, bring Dr. Rongara here, and also the Graduate Student, uh, the graduate student Organization, GSO, that contributed also to bring the Dr. Dongara here. So as Dr. Harrison said before, our guest is, is literally a rock star in the computational field. And his softwares, uh, mainly LeanPack and LayPack and MPI, have been used by most of the people in the audience. So I don't think there is anything more to say than introduce Dr. Dongara. And thank you for coming. Oh, thank you very much for that. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here as my first visit um, to Stony Brook, as it turns out. And um, uh, it's nice to, uh, to finally come and uh, be on campus. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few things today about high performance computing. And um, uh, just to make it more interesting and fun, if you have a question, ask the question during the talk. I'm happy to uh, take questions uh, during the talk. Um, we're going to look at high performance computing and some of the challenges that we see in the future. Uh, I'm, at Oak Ridge, I'm at the University of Tennessee, which is located in Knoxville, Tennessee. I also have a position at uh, Oak Ridge about uh, 40 miles away, and I hold a position at the University of Manchester um, uh, in England. I, I don't go there uh, every week, um, uh, but I, I do go there in the summers, and that's always fun. Um, okay, so we're going to take a look at high performance computing and um, look at uh, what the biggest machines are today and look at some of the adjustments that have to be made as we effectively try to use those extreme, extreme computers. And I'd like to do that through the eyes of some data that we've collected over time. So this is uh, something that's called the top 500. Top 500 is a benchmark and uh, it lists the 500 fastest computers uh, in the world. Um, uh, and that list gets updated twice a year. It gets updated uh, next week, as in fact. It gets updated on um, it's a Monday, I think, actually gets updated with a new set of machines. And it's also updated in, in June at a meeting. Um, the, the, the meeting next week is SC, which is going to be in Salt Lake City. There's going to be about uh, 10,000 of my closest friends. Or maybe it's 20,000. I forgot which number. 20,000 of my closest friends. And the other meeting is in Germany. And there's about 3,000 people that attend that meeting in Frankfurt uh, in, uh, in June. There's a website which contains all the data. So the benchmark says we want to solve that problem, AX equal B. And um, the matrix that you have to solve it, that, you, that you're going to be given, is a dense matrix. So it's going to be generated from some random uh, distribution. And you must solve it using a Gauss elimination with partial pivoting. So that's the algorithm you must use. That's been used in all the benchmarks, tests that we've performed since 1993. You get to implement it, though. And you get to implement it uh, using the best uh, optimization skills uh, you have on your architecture. Uh, so that algorithm, solving that problem, usually what happens is you, um, you make the matrix as big as possible. So think big, think huge, okay? Think, um, think millions. The, so the order of the matrix is usually, um, uh, I think the highest one is, is about 10, order 10 million matrix, 10 million by 10 million dense matrix being solved. 
on some system, on some matrix, on some machine. Um, and typically what we see is the, if you were to increase the size of the problem and run it on your computer, the rate of execution would increase until you reach some asymptotic point. So we're looking for the asymptotic point for your machine. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be looking at the rate of execution that's usually measured in floating point operations per second. Everything is 64-bit floating point operations. And the operations we're talking about are adds and multiplies. So that algorithm uh, consumes order n cubed floating point operations. So that gives you some sense of, the, uh, of uh, how, how things would increase over, uh, as you increase the size of the problem, uh, the complexity increases in just that way. And again, we're looking at the rate of execution, which is gonna asymptote out for your machine. Okay, so um, uh, through the eyes of that data, this is what supercomputing looks like today. So we have petaflop computers. So computers which have 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second, that's the rate of execution. Uh, and there are 95 computers on the list. That's gonna change on Monday. That number is gonna go up, of course. There'll be more, more machines, new machines, newer machines. So that's, uh, that's what we have today. Uh, out of the 500 machines, 95 have petaflop. And we see three technologies which are being used in supercomputers. One technology is um, uh, commodity processors. That is, put, um, put a lot of commodity processors in a box, interconnect them somehow, and we're gonna use that as the supercomputer do message passing between, between the nodes in that model. The second one is to use commodity processors with some kind of accelerator, something that boosts the performance. So GPUs are the, are the common way we think about boosting performance today. Some kind of um, uh, uh, thing which accelerates or, or speeds up floating point operations, which may not do much more than doing the floating point operations uh, very fast. And today we have 93 machines which use uh, GPUs uh, in, in them that are uh, hybrid in that sense. And the other is uh, lightweight cores. So we have machines which, have, uh, which are built out of very simple uh, cores, but usually have lots of them. And the example is uh, a Chinese processor called the Shenwei processor, I'll talk more about that. Um, ARM processors, the things that are used in your cell phone, are, are typically thought of as lightweight uh, processors. And uh, Intel has a processor today uh, called uh, Knight's, uh, Knight's Landing, which has, uh, which has 72 cores on a chip, 72 cores, and those cores are lightweight in the sense that they don't have all the capabilities that a normal Xeon processor would have. Uh, they, they, do, they don't have all the ability to do out-of-order execution, uh, to do many of the things that uh, might be found in a more sophisticated Intel processor. Uh, and, and those are the lightweight ones. So we see machines being built out of those three, those three models. Uh, we see interest in high-performance computing or supercomputing worldwide. Um, uh, and uh, in different, different areas. So one thing, if you take a look at the list of the 500 fastest computers, the interesting thing is about half of them are used in industry, not, not in research, not in academic situations, but uh, they're being deployed in an in industrial setting. So um, industry gets it. These provide some kind of strategic advantage and they're being used to help build better things for, for whatever company has, has the use of them. They're typically in the lower end of the list, not at the very high end of the list, however. And um, we see exascale projects existing in many countries. So we have petascale machines today. The next big threshold, let's call it, is, is exascale. So 10 to the 18 floating point operations per second. That's where we want to go. Uh, for the next uh, big, uh, big, uh, big machines in some sense. And we see in the US, we have an exascale program uh, in Japan, in Europe, as well as China has exascale programs. So we're all in some kind of race, let's call it, to, to get to exascale. It's not really a race, of course, but some people treat it that way. And um, if we take a look at the 500 computers, Intel processors are used in 91% of those computers. That's, that's stunning. Intel processors, commodity processors, in 91% of the machines. And AMD picks up another 3%. So x86 architecture is used in 94% of those machines. So that's, that's an incredible situation. You know, I've been around a long time. I can remember back when we had specialized machines, which were supercomputers built by companies like uh, Cray, uh, and uh, CDC and uh, other, other places that uh, clearly could not, uh, did not follow that model at all. Okay, so here's, um, here's sort of a snapshot, if you will, of high performance computing uh, since uh, 1993 when we started this top 500 list until, um, until uh, th this, this number here represents the June number one. So the red thing, the red line there is charting position number one on the list. 
So the fastest computer today is at 93 petaflops. So that's the rate of execution for solving that benchmark program, 93 petaflops. Um, the guy at the bottom of the list that just made it there is at 286 teraflops of computing power. That's what it, that's what it uh, ran the benchmark at. And this orange thing here is the sum, if you will, of the 500 computers. So that's an artificial number, Excel sheet computation. And that's at, um, uh, it's over a half a, half a exaflop today in terms of the computing power of the 500 fastest uh, computers. And uh, you, know, you can see what's happened over time. Uh, you know, it's sort of interesting to see. Uh, this is kind of a straight line. There's something that's going on about this point here that changes things. You know, maybe that's uh, something to do with the economy turned down. It could have something to do with uh, the end of uh, Denard scaling, which said something about uh, not keeping up with the same uh, rate of change uh, with the processing. It's not Moore's law, it's Denard scaling that uh, broke down at this point that gave us multi-core processors. Um, uh, you know, there's um, uh, the step function here. Occasionally we get machines which have a big boost in terms of performance that become number one. That occurred recently. It occurred also, you know, back in this time period here where a mach new machine came on the scene that was much more powerful than the previous ones. And, um, you know, the the, it, again, things change quite rapidly. The guy that's at the bottom of the list today is, uh, was equal to the sum of all the computers back in 2001. So this is an exponential thing. This is an incredible uh, situation taking place. Um, you know, going from number one to falling off the list takes about six to eight years. So these computers cost about $200 million. That's the price for the number one computer, roughly. Every, it's, it's roughly that. To, to buy, if you wanted to buy one, you would, you would spend $200 million. And in six years, it would be no longer even considered a supercomputer. You'd have to replace it, of course, uh, if you wanted to ma maintain the, the pace of things. So there's an investment that needs to be made uh, just in terms of the hardware. Let's forget about all the applications and software that need to be created to really build that uh, infrastructure. And um, you know, the technology is, is incredible. So my laptop here is an in, has an Intel processor. It's a dual core uh, Haswell processor. And that Haswell processor, um, uh, I can run the benchmark on it. And when I run the benchmark, I get 70 gigaflops out of my laptop, right? That's a machine I use to read email. I'm getting 70 gigaflops out of it. That's a stunning achievement in some sense, right? And uh, you know, not too long ago, that would have been um, faster than the number one computer. So this is a computer that was at Los Alamos. It was the number one computer back in 1993. It was a thinking machine CM5. It had 1,000 processors in it. Right? It cost $200 million. It was doing uh, you know, weapons calculations at Los Alamos. And I've got something which I use on airplanes and um, uh, has a battery life of 12 hours. So just incredible changes in really a short uh, period of time. And of course, um, you know, I, can, I can run the benchmark on my phone. So there's an app for that. You can download it and run it on your, your phone. When you run it on the phone, you get four gigaflops, OK? Four gigaflops out of that. And again, that would have been something that perhaps was on the uh, top 500 list uh, back in uh, equivalent back in 1996. Uh, um, four gigaflops, by the way, is what a Cray 2 was. Cray 2, of those people in the audience who know something about supercomputing, the old days supercomputing, that was a Cray 2. So incredible changes taking place in a very short uh, period of time. So this is that same list. Um, I've extended it now, extrapolated, if you will, out to uh, 2020. And the extrapolation says, you know, maybe we'll be at exaflop in 2020 if everything holds. Um, uh, you know, we were at a teraflop. We had a first teraflop machine. Uh, was back here in 1997. That was a machine that was called the ASCII Red. It was at Sandia National Laboratory. And um, back in uh, 2008, um, uh, there was a machine at Los Alamos National Lab called the Roadrunner, and that uh, that was the first petaflop uh, computer. And uh, then the exaflop machine. Uh, would be uh, maybe around 20, uh, 2020. And there's at least one group that says they're going to be having an exaflop machine in 2020. So that's uh, the Chinese. Chinese have put that stake in the ground. Uh, the US says they're going to get to exaflop probably in 2023 is when they, they believe they'll be in a position to develop exa, exaflops here in the US. So this is the top 10 computers uh, today. And uh, the way to read this is this guy's number one. It's, uh, it's at the National Supercomputing Center in, in Wuxi. 
and it's called the Sunway Tianhe Light, and it uses this processor. This is a Shenway 26010 processor. So this is a Chinese processor. So a Chinese processor uh, in a Chinese machine. That processor is a chip, one socket, and it has 260 cores. So there are 260 processors, cores, on that chip, uh, and that's used as the basis for this computer. And of course, they have lots of those in the box. And they have a custom interconnect. So the thing which connects the nodes together in this machine is not something that's a commodity off the shelf. They built it themselves. It's based on some Mellanox chips. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's based on um, uh, their own technology. And that Chinese machine has 10 million cores. 10 million. So if you're going to program for this machine, you know, think about writing a program which has to maintain on the order of 10 million threads of execution to run at scale, at scale in this, in this computer. And they achieved 93 uh, petaflops on the computer, and that was 74% of the theoretical peak performance. So the theoretical peak performance is the artificial calculation, right? So you look at the cycle time, how many operations you do per cycle, and what the, the number of processors in your machine, you multiply those things together and you get the theoretical peak performance. We know we can never obtain that. And then you run some benchmark and you see what you actually get. And they got 74%. And that's not too bad, considering a, a 10 million processors. So that was run on the 10 million core version. And uh, to make that run, um, uh, we measure the power that's required to make that run. So power is measured in megawatts. So this machine used 15, it's under load, it's 15 megawatts is the, is, the, is the requirement for this machine, 15 megawatts. So one megawatt year in the US is $1 million. So uh, the machine to turn it on, this machine is about $15 million in power in electric uh, cost per, per year, right? So, so again, power is a big deal here. And this is a measure of efficiency. So that's flops per watt. So this machine has a number of six gigaflops per watt. You want that number to be as high as possible, right, for your, for your computer. And you can just look down the list here and see uh, how things compare. Uh, the number two machine is a Chinese machine as well. That's uh, at, in Guangzhou. It's the Tianhe 2. It was made by the National University for Defense Technology. So that's a... Um, uh, that's a, uh, 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 a university which is, uh, has been making supercomputers for a very, a very long time. And that machine is based on Intel parts, and that's uh, part of a story I'll tell a little bit later. Remember, Intel parts in a Chinese machine, they have three million cores in that machine, uh, and they achieved uh, 33 petaflops of performance. So roughly a third of the performance of the number one machine. So that number one machine is a big, uh, is a big step up. And they get 62% of the peak. Their, their machine is running at 17 megawatts, even though it's much less power. And their efficiency as a result is around, uh, let's call it two gigaflops per watt. So th those are the, the, the top two machines. Oak Ridge has a machine uh, where I work uh, called the Titan. It's made by Cray. It's made out of AMD and uh, has accelerators in it. And it has a half a million cores, the way I count cores. And that's a machine which is running about 17 uh, 17 petaflops, and uh, you could see the power requirements there. So power is a big deal on these computers. It's a, it's a, it's an important thing. Uh, you got to, you got to be aware of it. You got to be conscious of the fact of how much power you're using. It's an expensive uh, commodity, and that's, uh, that's part of an equation that, uh, that has to be satisfied. Um, uh, gigaflops per watt. This machine turns out to be the highest. Uh, uh, the most efficient in that sense. You can see the other guys are around two. Occasionally we see machines which are lo lower than that. And the three architectures I mentioned are, are exhibited in the list. These are lightweight cores. This is a hybrid system with accelerators. And uh, there's machines here which just use uh, commodity parts, so, such as the machine here at Los Alamos and Sandia National Lab based on strictly uh, in Intel commodity parts. Yeah. So I noticed that uh, the Titan is actually the, has the lowest percentage of peak. Uh, Titan has a low number for peak, and, and part of that is reflected by this thing here. So accelerators tend to draw down the, the, the peak. So they, they provide additional capability, but it's hard to, to, to extract all of that performance uh, because of the architecture and, and the way things have to be moved between the, the two parts of that, uh, that computer. Um, so, uh, you know, this is quite impressive. The, the number one machine is quite, uh, quite an impressive machine. If you take a look and, and uh, realize these numbers here, 10 million cores, 93 petaflops, uh, running at uh, six uh, gigaflops per watt. You know, if I look at the next six machines, I have to add up the next six machines to, just to match the performance we see on that one machine. 
So that's a big honking machine there. And uh, you know, when you take a look at that, the, the, the machine is five times faster than the machine we have at Oak Ridge. So that's the fastest machine in the US. And um, if you take a look at all the computers in DOE, Department of Energy is a big uh, proponent of uh, simulation and they, 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 they buy a lot of high performance machines and put them in place. That one machine is, is about one and a half times all the sum of all the DOE machines. So that's a big machine they have there for doing uh, calculations. And it'll uh, be interesting to see how that works. Um, uh, so this is looking at the 500 computers. There's 500 rectangles here. Each rectangle represents a, um, a system. And the area of the rectangle is reflective of the performance. So this is the biggest, and they're, they're organized by country. And um, uh, this is the biggest rectangle. So that's the number one computer, the, 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 Tiahu, uh, the Tiahu light. Um, and uh, this is the number two computer. That's the number three. And if you add up things, China has 167 machines on the list. 167 of the 500 computers are in China. The US has 165. That's the first time that's, um, that, that's happened. The first time the US has dropped below half of the machines. So China's made a big investment in high performance computing. Right? They're, they're, uh, they understand the value of that and they're investing, developing the technology uh, to use um, for, uh, uh, for simulation. So again, China has a third of the machines that are on this list. The US has fallen for the first point uh, since we uh, started collecting, uh, collecting this data. Um, and if you take a look at the sum of the computers in the US, and this is done over time, the sum of the machines on the list from the US, you get a curve which looks something like this. Uh, if you take a look at the, UK, uh, the EU, uh, European Union countries, it's parallel uh, to what's happened, uh, what's happened in the US in terms of the investment in high performance computing, a little bit lower, but the investment's there. Uh, Japan has um, you know, matched at times the performance of the uh, European uh, countries in terms of the uh, high performance computing. There was a dip here during the recession, I guess, and uh, more recently they haven't quite uh, recovered uh, to that same level, but uh, you, you could see what's happened in Japan. And the striking one is, is really China. So China, had no computers on the list. There were zero computers in 2001, and then the investment started, and they built that up. So today they have uh, more uh, uh, computing power, let's call it, uh, than we have in, in the US. So that's, again, a striking, uh, a striking uh, situation. Uh, in the US, uh, the Department of Energy is a big um, investor in high performance computing, and that's gonna continue into the future. So there's a, there's a plan here to deploy machines which are order 100 petaflops, It'll be probably around 250, 300 petaflop systems. And that'll take place in 2017. They're gonna be installed and then operational in 2018. That's the story that we have today. And there'll be three machines in the US. So there'll be two machines which will be, uh, quote, identical uh, at Livermore, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And those machines will be IBM based. So IBM processors, power series, processors with NVIDIA accelerators, again, to boost the performance, connected together using uh, uh, interconnect made by Mellanox, who provide an uh, InfiniBand-like um, uh, in interface. And then the, the third machine will be at Argonne National Lab, and that's gonna be um, a machine that's based on Intel parts. So that'll be based on, uh, the current Intel processor is called Knight's Landing, and Intel's next generation is called Knight's Hill. And that, again, will be lightweight cores Lots of cores, think hundreds of cores on a chip uh, and uh, replicating uh, that to build out to a system of around 200, 300 uh, petaflops. And after these machines get deployed, the next series of machines in the US would be exascale. That's the, that's the current thinking in terms, of, uh, in terms of that. Okay, the Department of Commerce um, uh, took some action against China and uh, they told them um, these four places here National Supercomputing Center in Guangzhou, the guy that uh, is the site of the number two machine. The National Supercomputing Center in Tianjin it has, a, has a, a lower performance machine, uh, but still very powerful. The National University for Defense Technology, the guys who develop supercomputers, and the National Supercomputing Center in Shenzha, which is where the number two machine is located. Those places cannot purchase Intel parts. So there's a, there's a ban against those four places from acquiring uh, Intel parts as a result uh, perhaps of uh, the, China uh, uh, making uh, use of Intel to, be, uh, to, to build their high performance uh, computers. That happened in February uh, of, of 2015. And um, uh, since that time, 
Um, China's expanded its uh, focus on high performance computing. In fact, they basically are saying we're going to do anything but buy from the US in terms of hardware uh, components. Uh, they are developing their own technology. The machine in Wuxi, this, this machine here is Chinese based, Chinese processor, Chinese interconnect, Chinese operating system, Chinese software associated with it. Uh, the, the, the machine that's at the National University for Defense Technology is being upgraded, taking out all the Intel parts and replacing them with uh, ARM processors along with an accelerator that they develop uh, in China. And uh, Sugun is a company that uh, makes uh, high performance machines in China and there's a rumor that they're working with the Chinese Academy to build a machine that's going to be based on AMD processors. So they're going to build their own chips. Uh, based on AMD processors. And uh, you know, then the most recent five-year plan, there's a government push here to develop the domestic internal China, Chinese high-performance computing, and uh, you know, they're, gonna, they're gonna build an exascale machine. 2020 is the target date for them to deploy that exascale machine uh, within, within China. So this is the processor that's used in the number one computer. It's uh, the first homegrown many-core processor uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's produced in China. It was designed and developed in, in China, fabricated in China. It's based on 28 nanometer technology. That's sort of old technology. That's, a, that's an important uh, a aspect about keeping the uh, performance uh, ratio very good. It, um, it, it has 260 cores on that chip. So there's one chip which has 260 cores. And that chip has a theoretical peak performance of three teraflops. So three trillion floating point operation theoretically is possible for that uh, processor. And it, um, it sort of looks like this. So that chip, that one chip, has uh, what they call four core groups on the chip. And the four core groups are divided into um, in, in the following way. They have a master processor for each, each one of those core groups and then a, um, a computational cluster made of an eight by eight grid of cores, lightweight cores, 64 cores plus a uh, a master core in control of things, and then four of those on the chip, connected by a network on the chip, uh, and then that uh, goes out over a link uh, to, uh, to the rest of the nodes in the system. So the way you, you would think about programming this is the master processor is in control of things. He's gonna be running the MPI task, and he's gonna be uh, um, uh, communicating out this link here with other processes. And uh, this uh, computational core is where the computation is actually going to be done. So the master is going to start something. It's going to be done on this uh, grid of uh, uh, 64 cores, lightweight cores. Computation will be done and then uh, uh, carry on the computation. Each of these clusters uh, has some memory associated with it. Uh, there's 32 gigabytes of memory uh, for, that, uh, for that whole ensemble there. This processor has a, has a three teraflop peak performance, but it has um, the ability to, um, to do 22 floating point operations for every byte of data that moves from memory. So that's sort of a, a trade-off between that. Ideally, we would like that, number, that ratio to be one. One floating point operation per byte of transfer from memory. This has 22. So that says it's heavily weighted to doing floating point. It's gonna be hard to move data around in this machine. The performance is gonna really be degraded as a result of that unless you take very careful control of how uh, how you get reuse of information uh, from moving information from data. These cores here have no cache associated with them. They have a very small amount of, um, of user-controlled uh, 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 user memory, and that's, uh, that's on the order of 32 kilobytes uh, for, for those cores. So very small amount of local real estate on each of those cores for, for doing, uh, for, doing uh, uh, operate, for getting reuse of, of data. And they take that, um, so that's called a node. One of, those, one of those chips makes up a node. And they have a cabinet now which has 1,000 nodes in it. So think of 1,000 nodes in a, in, a, in a rack, basically. The rack is about one meter by about um, uh, almost two meters uh, in, in height. Um, and um, uh, that's 1,000 uh, 1, nodes. And that's, uh, that gives us uh, three petaflops in that one rack. It's a water-cooled a device, so they have water flowing through the boards to, uh, to cool it. And um, the whole room has 40 cabinets. So the whole room is about the size of a basketball court with 40 cabinets uh, interconnected um, with 40,000 nodes, 40,000 of those chips in it. 
uh, and the peak performance is about 125 uh, petaflops. Um, uh, that's, that's 10 million cores, about 1.3 petabytes of memory. The memory that they use in this machine is DDR3 memory, so that's old memory. Old memory, it's very slow, and it's very slow, but it's also very uh, good in terms of efficiency, power efficiency. It doesn't draw much power, as much power as our, our modern computers with DDR4 memory. Uh, and that helps to keep the power budget low. Remember I said it was a very efficient machine, uh, ultimately for running that benchmark. Uh, 93 petaflops for the benchmark, uh, which is 74% uh, of theoretical peak. We have another benchmark called HPCG, and I'll go into more detail about that benchmark. It's something which is not solving a dense matrix, it's doing an iterative method. Iterative method uh, is going to be based on some uh, technique which requires a sparse matrix times vector operation. And for this benchmark, it gets 0 0.2, 0.32 petaflops, and that's 0.3% of the theoretical peak. 0.3%, so that's a very low number, right? So that shows the weakness, I'll say, of moving data around inside this, uh, inside this architecture. It's water-cooled machine, six gigaflops per watt, and um, the Gordon Bell Award, I'll, I'll mention this later, uh, the Gordon Bell Award is, is uh, given out at the SC meeting next week, and it's a, it's a big deal. You get $10,000, um, uh, you compete by submitting a paper, and uh, they have three entries uh, for the Gordon Bell Award. So it'll be see, uh, interesting to see. This machine cost about $280 million uh, to put together the machine, and that's the building, the rental of the building, the hardware, the software costs, everything is, is, comes, to that, uh, comes to that amount of money. There's a report, if you're interested, there's a report here uh, which uh, talks about the machine in great detail, and uh, that's, uh, that's there. I'll just mention this uh, benchmarking thing. So this is, um, you know, the LIMPAC benchmark is something that was started uh, back in uh, 1977. Uh, it, it came out of this, uh, this package of software. Uh, LINPAC is a, is a package of mathematical software for solving systems of linear equations, and uh, these four guys put it together. Um, uh, and, um, uh, you know, it was done at a time when uh, computers, it, uh, uh, high performance computing was a little bit different than we have today. Floating point was very expensive on these machines. And um, these four guys, this is um, uh, Jim Bunch, this is Pete Stewart, this is Cleve Moeller. So Cleve, you may not know Cleve, but uh, he's the guy who gave us MATLAB. So he's, uh, he was the guy who uh, founded MathWorks. And this is me. So this is a, a, a 1977 version with a little bit more hair. Um, uh, this is my car. I can, you, know, you can see the license plate, but it says Linpac. Um, uh, so so in, the, in this, in this uh, user's guide that we had, um, uh, we put together a benchmark uh, for, for solving systems of equations. I wanted to give people a feeling for um, how much time it would take to solve using our software. And in the appendix is this chart. This chart lists all the high performance machines of the time. There's Cray 1s and CDC machines and IBM things, and there's even a PDP machine down here somewhere. Um, uh, and uh, it, gives the, it gives the time it takes to solve a matrix of, of order 100. So that was the biggest machine, that was the biggest matrix I can get into some of these machines, so that was the size that was used. And then the scribble here is my handwritten uh, note about the uh, megaflop rate uh, for these machines. So the Cray one was the highest one at 14 megaflops. Uh, so that's sort of where this benchmarking uh, process uh, began. And you have to remember that back in 1977, floating point was very expensive. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we, Intel's early version of processors didn't do floating point. They had a coprocessor which did the floating point. And you would have to communicate between the two, uh, the two things, very much like we do with accelerators uh, today. Um, and uh, floating point was a big deal. And uh, the benchmark, uh, uh, the benchmark is, uh, is, should be, is criticized because it, um, it, it measures floating point uh, for things like matrix multiply. So something where it's very easy to extract performance and really doesn't reflect the kinds of things we do today on uh, high performance uh, computers. So there's lots of benchmarks out there. Um, uh, you know, some of these, uh, you know, they measure different things, which is a good thing. And uh, we thought it would be uh, good if we could uh, develop a benchmark which, um, uh, which uh, wasn't uh, based on technology that was around in 1977, but bas basically looking at some of the more important issues about the machines that we have today. And uh, that's this benchmark here. So it's called HPCG. It's a conjugate gradient benchmark. 
Uh, it's an iterative method used to solve large, sparse matrix problems. In this case, the matrix, so we're solving the same problem. Uh, in this case, the matrix is not dense. It's a sparse matrix. It's positive, definite, symmetric, and it uses a preconditioner, and there's a bunch of things that go on inside this benchmark to, um, to uh, tax the architecture uh, to really stress uh, certain components in it. The LINPAC benchmark stresses floating point exclusively, almost, and this benchmark is trying to do something a little bit different uh, with that. And this is the results of uh, that benchmark. This is the, this is the top 10 machines. Uh, this is the number one machine for this benchmark, uh, for the HPCG. It's the, it's, the, it's the machine that's number two on the top 500 list. It's the Tianhe 2. It has three million cores. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the benchmark run for LINPAC is at 33 petaflops. The, be the, uh, the benchmark run here is at 0.58 petaflops. So you see the difference. It's achieving about 1% of the theoretical peak. And you know, if you go down this list here, you see that very consistently, very low percent of the theoretical peak performance uh, for this benchmark. And that more or less is what we see in real applications. So things really reflect uh, are more reflective of this benchmark than, than the others. The, the guy that gets the highest percent on this list here is this one. That's the uh, Japanese K computer. has a very balanced architecture in terms of data movement and floating point operations. It was designed to do high performance computing and it does a pretty good job uh, both at both ends of that uh, spectrum. Uh, high performance and low performance uh, uh, in terms of that. So um, uh, again, you know, that's, uh, we see that the, the, number, the number one machine on the top 500 gets this 0.3%. It comes in at number, at number three on this uh, particular benchmark here, not uh, really showing some of the weaknesses associated with that architecture. Okay, and, and uh, this, this graph here, this chart here looks at um, the theoretical peak performance, that's the gray dots, and the orange dots represent the LINPAC benchmark so you could see uh, the, the ranking here, and you could see the, the difference between those two, very close to the theoretical peak. And then when you look at the HPCG numbers, the, the one that does an iterative method, you see that rate falling. So that, per, that presents a bookends, if you will, for, for many applications. Your application is going to fall somewhere in between there. Probably, uh, if you're doing uh, iterative methods on sparse matrices, more like the, the performance you might see at this lower end. Um, I mentioned the Gordon Bell Award, um, so I'll just go elaborate just a moment. So Gordon Bell um, was a computer architect. He, uh, he helped design some, uh, m many of the DEC machines from uh, digital, uh, the, the, the DEC VAX machine is his, one of his designs. And um, uh, yeah, he's sort of a wealthy guy. He wants to, uh, in 1987, he developed this uh, idea of a prize. And the idea is to reward or to, um, uh, to, uh, to point out, um, uh, to recognize outstanding achievements in high performance computing. And the purpose here is to uh, award um, uh, uh, the most progress that's been made in parallel computing uh, with um, uh, real applications. So he's gonna give away $10,000 of his money. He's endowed this, uh, this, this award. So every year $10,000 is given away to the, to the uh, paper which shows an enhancement in performance on a high performance machine solving a real application, a real application problem. Uh, so the authors mark a paper that's submitted to this SC conference with, uh, uh, as I mentioned, 20,000 20, of my closest friends. Um, uh, that, that goes into the competition for the Gordon Bell prize. There's a committee then which looks at all the papers that have been marked that way and selects six of those papers uh, to be finalists. So six papers right now are listed as uh, finalists. And then uh, presentations are made uh, at uh, SC and then they're going to announce the winner uh, at the SC meeting next week on Thursday. So these are the six papers that are finalists. So there's a paper here from Lawrence Livermore National Lab doing uh, some sim simulations here in molecular dynamics. There's a paper from Imperial College uh, looking at uh, some things written in Python achieving uh, petascale computing. There's a paper that uh, deals with, uh, uh, that, that, that was done on this K computer at, uh, re in, in Japan at RECAN, uh, looking at this uh, below uh, ground uh, dynamics uh, for something or other. And then three papers. Uh, from uh, have been done on this Chinese machine. So these are these are applications which have run on this machine that are running at scale. So I mentioned 10 million cores running at 10 million cores, implementing something, uh, getting very high performance, and it'll be interesting to see uh, who the um, who the winner is in the end. Um, you know, looking at high performance computing uh, over the past uh, few decades, uh, we see this incredible change take place. Uh, Intel with its uh, Xeon processors. 
uh, is really at the forefront of a lot of the change that we have. And as I mentioned, uh, they're in uh, 90 some percent of the high performance computers that we have. And you know, back, uh, back in the early days of the Xeon processors, the processor was capable of doing two floating point operations per cycle um, on that machine, double precision floating point operations. And uh, with Nehalem in 2009, they doubled that. So they're getting four floating point operations per cycle per core of that, uh, of that uh, processor. And then Sandy Bridge in 2011, they doubled it again. Eight floating point operations per core out of that uh, processor. Uh, Haswell has 16 floating point operations. And today with Skylake and also with uh, Knight's Landing, uh, we're at 32 floating point operations. So we have a chip which has 70 cores on it each core doing 32 floating point operations per cycle. So these are, these are vector operations uh, using an using a augmented instruction set on the chip, but a lot of floating point capability going on here. So there, these, these processors today that we have are over provisioned, I'll say, for doing floating point, right? So they have a tremendous floating point capability. And the floating point capability is not really the, the point uh, that's, uh, that's gonna be stressed here. The point that gets stressed is data movement. So when you take a look at how, uh, uh, how much it costs to move data around in these machines, so if we're gonna read something from main memory and get it to the part of the machine where the computation can be done, it takes 167 cycles to move the data from memory through the memory hierarchy to the place where the actual operation is gonna be done. And in that uh, time, uh, you could have done about 2,500 floating point operations. So the machine has been over provisioned for floating point and has, has weakness with uh, respect to data movement. So you need to effectively get reuse of your data to have any chance of actually tapping into that high floating point execution rate on these, on these processors. And that becomes a, a big issue in terms of uh, overall performance. So, um, you know, we have this classical analysis that we think of in terms of um, <clears throat> in terms of being able to understand our algorithm and how it's gonna perform on a machine. You know, in the old days, if I had two algorithms, I would look at those algorithms and look at the floating point, uh, uh, number of floating point operations, and I could pretty much tell based on the operation count which one was gonna be faster. Well, today I can't do that. I can't do that because I can't tell, I may not be able to tell quickly how much data reuse I get uh, out of those algorithms. And it's all about reuse today, making sure you can tap into that high floating point execution rate. So the operation count is really not a good indicator of the time to solve, uh, to solve our problems today. And if you take a look at um, uh, what's happening, so this is, this is an example here on the, uh, on the Knight's Landing. So this is Intel's many core processor, and we're doing three operations here. We're taking a look at doing a vector operation. We're doing a DAXPY, A, X, plus Y. That's a simple vector operation. We're looking at matrix vector multiplication, have a dense matrix times a vector, um, uh, doing that operation and doing matrix multiply. And if I run that on this Knight's Landing processor, this is the performance I see for each of those operations. For vector operations, I see something on the order of 35 gigaflops. For matrix vector, I see something on the order of uh, 80 gigaflops. And for matrix multiply, I see performance on the order of uh, of two teraflops out of this chip. So matrix multiply is, is really able to extract performance, is able to get at that 32 floating point operations per core, uh, per cycle, that that's, uh, that's possible. And um, uh, you know, when you're looking, comparing it to the theoretical peak performance of this machine, uh, matrix multiply is re really where you wanna be. So if you design an algorithm and your algorithm runs with vector operations, that's the peak performance that you will see on this processor limited to that, uh, to that execution rate. You're gonna be hampered because of data movement, data motion, not reusing data is gonna be the, the major uh, fall in performance. Even if you raise the level to matrix vector operations, you still don't come anywhere near that theoretical peak performance. And only through matrix multiply, getting that reuse of uh, data uh, will you be able to achieve anywhere close to the theoretical peak? So matrix multiply does n cubed operations with n squared pieces of data. So that's where the, that's where the um, economy comes in. That's where you get reuse of data, where the other ones have a very poor trade-off. n squared operations and n squared data movement or n operations with n uh, data movement. So n neither of these operations will uh, be very effective. So if I take a look, so there's a factor of 35 between those two. So if I take a look at, um, 
at uh, doing some operations. So this is a comparison of three generations of software. And the generations are looking at the same algorithm. It's computing a singular value decomposition. So the, the, these, are, these are software that comes from packages called IcePack, LinPack, and LAPack. So I've had a hand in writing each of those uh, packages. And uh, IcePack was uh, written uh, based on some Algol code. And that Algol code was uh, organized uh, by, by, by rows, so the matrix axes were by rows. We translated the Algol into Fortran. Fortran references things by columns, and as a result, the performance was pretty poor. So the ice pack results are things that are normalized here to one. So I'm running the old ice pack code on this processor. It's a dual socket, eight core Sandy Bridge processor, running it for different size matrices and looking at the performance. And I've normalized it so that that ice pack routine is one. For, for all of the matrix sizes that I have. And uh, when I look at um, LinPack, LinPack said, well, we don't want to organize things by rows, we want to organize things by columns because Fortran stores things by columns. We thought we had a better way of looking at it and organize things to use the level one BLAS operations. Level one BLAS operations are vector operations. Just doing single vector operations, very poor reuse of data, but organized by, uh, by columns. So the, uh, the LinPack routines for this particular uh, organization uh, perform better than the IcePack routines, as you might expect, and they achieve a performance which is probably two to three times what the IcePack routine does. Same algorithm, exactly the same number of floating point operations, uh, but uh, organizing the computation, refactoring the code a little bit differently. And with LAPAC, we decided to uh, organize things a little bit differently. It's organized by columns, but we organize things by uh, panels, trying to get reuse of data. We read in a, a, a chunk of columns and then do operations on that chunk of columns. The chunk is, is determined to fit into cache so that we get reuse of data. So we're getting reuse of data effectively using the memory hierarchy, and we see a bump in terms of uh, performance. So that, that performance there is, is about six times the performance of the original ice pack code. And that's running on a single core. If I turn on parallelism within this particular uh, uh, ensemble here, the performance jumps up to something which, which is getting uh, on the order of uh, uh, 40, uh, 45 times the performance of that original uh, ice pack code when it was uh, written. Uh, but if we take a look at that um, LA pack code, uh, the code that's organized by panels, uh, we see the following situation. I've got an operation that's going to deal with this panel here. It's going to introduce zeros into this panel, both on the rows and columns of this, uh, this thing here, to reduce the matrix to ultimately a bidiagonal form, where then I'm going to compute the singular values of that bidiagonal matrix. The cost of doing that is n eight n sorry, 8n cubed floating point over three floating point operations. So that's the cost of doing that reduction. And if I look at how I do that, I use level two BLAS operations and level three BLAS operations, matrix vector and matrix matrix operations to get to that point. Half of them being matrix vector and half of them being uh, matrix multiply. And um, uh, you know, the result is I'm doing half of the work based on a performance that's way down here and half of the work that's being done on performance that's way up here. So I'm getting some of that performance, but I'm really limited because of that lower rate of execution for those matrix vector operations and the algorithm turns out to be memory bound. So I'm reading data, lots of data in this algorithm. I want to avoid that. So we think about refactoring the algorithm, changing the algorithm in this case, introducing perhaps more floating point operations to make it uh, more, uh, more uh, uh, get better use of matrix multiply. So this has two stages to get to bidiagonal form. It takes our original matrix, reduces it to this banded form here initially, and that I can do using matrix multiply exclusively, and then, uh, then come up with an algorithm which gnaws away at this banded form to get it down to tridiagonal, and uh, that can be done in a very economy, uh, economic way uh, using, uh, using cash to the best of its advantage. So I have the first stage going at um, matrix multiply. That's an algorithm which can run uh, asynchronously in a data flow-like fashion and get the highest levels of performance. And the second stage then does this uh, gnawing away at this matrix in a cache-aware, cache-friendly uh, basis uh, to get down to the performance. The result of that is the performance uh, or, or the, the actual algorithm takes 25% more floating point operations. So I've changed the operation count. I'm doing more floating point operations now, but those operations are being done using matrix multiply. 
And uh, the original one uh, did uh, this, this number of floating point operations, and I'm, I'm running basically at uh, 10 thirds n cubed floating point operations, plus a little bit more to gnaw away at that banded matrix. And the results of that is an increase in performance. And I see a, a factor of six increase in terms of the, 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 the time to solution. Think of this as time to solution in this case. The speed up, that is, is, is a factor of six for the algorithm, which is two stages, doing more floating point operations, 25% more floating point operation, but ending up with something which is six times uh, more effective in terms of the uh, overall count of operations. So it's hard today to really say that uh, one algorithm is better unless we have a detailed understanding of what's going on inside the algorithm, how much data reuse is being had, and uh, how things are actually uh, working in that sense. Uh, let me just uh, start to conclude here with a, with a couple things. So we have the conventional wisdom, and that conventional wisdom is changing. The old conventional wisdom and the new conventional wisdom. The old conventional wisdom said the peak clock frequency was a primary limiting factor of uh, performance. And today, we understand that power really is a, is a limiting factor in terms of how these machines are put together in future design machines. So we really have to be concerned about how much power these machines are consuming. Uh, the cost, the old uh, uh, wisdom was that the floating point operations was the biggest cost uh, in the system and we wanted to optimize for, uh, for compute and today uh, data movement is really the critical thing. Data being moved around in these machines is the most expensive thing and we have to minimize data motion in order to effectively uh, extract the performance that these machines can give. Uh, can, in the old days we had modest growth in parallelism uh, by adding a node or two uh, today we have this exponential growth in parallelism. We have, we have chips which have 260 cores and machines which are being built which have now uh, you know, tens of millions of, uh, of threads of execution in them. So the, the concurrency is really at a point where we have to be very aware of that. Memory scaling, we have this, uh, uh, the bytes per flop uh, capacity was uh, uh, being able to maintain this byte to flop ratio. In the old days it was one byte of movement per flop, floating point operation. Uh, that you do. Today we're in a situation where the floating point rates are increasing. Uh, we saw on the fastest computer, um, th there's a ratio of 20, 21 floating point operations per byte of data that gets moved. Uh, for the night's landing, that number is at seven floating point operations per byte that gets moved. So there still is a big, a big gap uh, that we have there. So memory uh, becomes a, uh, a really an important uh, issue in terms of data movement. Uh, in the old days, we had this uh, uniform kind of system performance. Uh, today, we have heterogeneous architectures. We have issues with uh, frequency scaling. Uh, different processors are going to be running at different frequencies, even though they're the same, uh, the same processor type. And that's going to that's gonna lead to uh, a number of issues that have to be taken care of in terms of how effectively we can use these machines. And reliability, uh, the hardware uh, was uh, part of the issue there. And today, we really can't count on the hardware protecting us uh, from all the errors that are going to occur. When you have uh, s machines that have, uh, you know, 10 million cores and that, uh, you know, errors or, or things will break, that will be a common situation in these, in these machines. So this, this represents some of the key issues that we are concerned about in designing the next generation of software, which we're engaged in today. Uh, the first thing is trying to um, uh, reduce the amount of synchronization that we have in our programs. The programming model that we currently think of is, for parallelism is a fork join model of parallelism. We have a loop, that loop can run in parallel. We think about doing that across all the processors and then we, we collapse down to a single thread of execution. So you can't do that when you have 10 million cores, 10 million threads of execution. You can't have 10 million things running and then collapse it down to one and then start up again. The performance will, be, uh, will, will, will suffer in a very tremendous way. So we have to have some way of breaking that um, bulk synchronous processing and data flow is a good uh, programming model that we might, uh, we might focus on. Communication is an important thing. We want to come up with algorithms which minimize the amount of communication that they have. You can go off on the corner and come up with algorithms which minimize, uh, develop an algorithm which minimizes the amount of communication uh, for a particular uh, implementation and then try to realize that uh, algorithm. Mixed precision is a thing which uh, perhaps we should focus on a little bit more. So single and double precision, 32 and 64 bit arithmetic. There's a factor of two in terms of the speed of the floating point operations. There's also a factor of two in terms of data motion. So if we can do operations at 32 bit arithmetic, maybe we should take advantage of that in our algorithms. Today, uh, with a big push to um, uh, deep learning, uh, uh, neural networks and things like that, 
we don't even need 32-bit. Uh, so they have hardware today which is based on 16-bit floating point arithmetic, running very fast for do the kind, doing the kinds of operations uh, that, uh, that uh, deep, uh, deep learning uh, are, are targeting. And there's a big market for that. That's going to be a very important tool, I think, uh, uh, not only for science but for uh, many other areas as well. Auto-tuning is a critical thing. There's so many knobs on these machines. I don't want to leave it to the user to do all the adjustments to get everything just right. So we have to build this into the software. So think of the software as sort of adjusting to the underlying hardware that it has and adjusting in terms of how it uh, proportions the work and carries on the computation in the presence of change that's taking place. I mentioned this issue about frequency scaling. We have processors that are adjusting the frequency dynamically without our control and we want to be able to take advantage of that somehow within, within the program context and do something smart uh, to adapt to that. We want to build fault resilient algorithms. Uh, failure is going to be an option on these machines and we have to have some way to combat, uh, combat that and carry on the computation in the presence of uh, failure. Today our model for computing is broken. MPI doesn't have a model for, for failure. So if a process terminates or, or ends for whatever reason, your application is going to fall over. So if you have a long running application, you had better do a checkpoint in order to restart from that computation. We're starting to think of algorithms which have built in mechanisms that can resist failure, either mathematically transition through process failure or be able to recover uh, information from a lost state and carry on the computation in the presence of that failure, perhaps by having additional information uh, carried along in the algorithm. And the last thing that we're interested in is uh, issues with reproducibility. So the idea here is if I run an application today on my machine, I run that same application tomorrow on the same machine with the same data, do I get the same answer? And some people insist on getting the same answer. So guys who certify reactors insist on getting the same answer today and tomorrow. The weather, the climate, uh, the, the weather guys in fact have to certify that their applications will in fact do this. And that requires us to do something special because we don't have reproducibility. Well, on our machines today, if I run my application, I can't determine the way in which uh, reduction operations are done. I can't determine the order in which that reduction is going to be done. So that summation that occurs, it may be done in a different order today and then tomorrow uh, on, on, my, on my hardware. So I have to, um, uh, so, and that'll lead to small round off errors and those round off errors of course could be magnified by ill conditioning or whatever. And um, we want to build into the, into the software the mechanism to have that reproducibility because some people insist on it. Now I'm a, I'm a numerical guy so I know about error bounds and I can give you error bounds for all the algorithms I have. I give you a very tight range in which the answers are good until but some people require that. Uh, that, that, kind of, um, that kind of effect. So let me uh, conclude there. I'm happy to answer any questions that, um, that you may have. It's an exciting time to be involved in high performance computing. There are many things going on uh, which require attention and uh, lead to very interesting problems. Uh, those problems are, are critical to be solved and uh, we need mechanisms, uh, innovative ideas and uh, uh, better solutions than what we have today. So thanks for your attention.